Vancouver? Anybody? Sometimes never last, but some people do. Okay. Anyway, yeah, you gotta you gotta have hope and and um, and so I, I think that bringing um, encouragement uh, to y'all for for however long the Lord has me do that, um, and it, it's it's kind of fun. This this week's a little tougher than usual because. I, I want to give you information. I, I want to share with you how to deal with a conundrum. Who knows what a conundrum is? Puzzling problem. Yeah, it's a it's a problem that's that's very difficult. It's it's maybe even unsolvable. Um, it can be something very serious, or or it could be something simple. But a conundrum is a situation we are in in our life where it's very difficult to solve. And I'm going to share a, I'm going to share a personal testimony with you this morning because I have been in a conundrum um, for a, about three months. And some of you have even noticed it. Um, I fake it until I make it, um, and usually I can come in here perhaps a little heavy. Um, I don't sleep very well on Saturday night. Um, I prepare. I, Saturday is when I, I, I write my message. All week long I let it simmer like a crock pot. <laughs> you know what I mean? But on Saturday... On Saturday, I, I put it down on paper. Um, this has been different, though, because this is really, um, it's prepared, but also it's coming from my heart. Because I want to tell you about my conundrum. Don't worry, I'm not sick. Uh, well, I'm, people think I'm a little mentally ill. Besides <laughs> that, <laughs> I'm okay. And incidentally, excuse me for one minute as I greet our people um, uh, on uh, Facebook. Hi, I'm Pastor Bill. You're, you've tuned in to Thrive Worship Center. We're in Vienna, West Virginia. And uh, it's a thriving uh, metropolis here in the, the northern part of West Virginia. And I pray you enjoy this message. This message today is called the conundrum. So we determine what a conundrum is, right? You say, Pastor Bill, what is, what is your conundrum? What's going on in your life? Well, my father is my conundrum. All of y'all have met my dad, I'm sure. Um, and I, it, it's no secret um, that part of my personal testimony, which eventually brought me to Christ, everything that happens to you in your life, friends, either takes you down the road of darkness or down the road of light. There's, there's no middle ground. By the time you're an adult, it's time to, as I speak to the men in the room, it's time to man up. Yeah. Either go left or right. As the guy said in that movie Tombstone, either start shooting or get off, the, get out of the corral. You know, get in the game, get in the fight. Amen. And so... In life, we we find ourselves sometimes at that crossroads, right? And our formative years is what gets us there. No one escapes childhood unscathed. You could have Ozzy, Ozzy Harriet, whatever their name is, Ozzy and Harriet, the Cleaver, the Beavers, whatever. They could be mom and dad. You, there's still stuff that goes on, you know. And I happen to know someone who had about as perfect a childhood as you could have. And a person's name is Michelle, my dear wife. She's in Huntington. She visits her mom every other weekend to help her out. And, and yet, she's told me a couple of uh, things that happened in her childhood that were just uh, troubling, right? No one gets out of childhood unscathed. And as we go from childhood into our teenage years, and then into our young adult years, we begin to really form and fashion what our worldview is going to be. 
A worldview is how you view the world and how it affects what you do. Everyone has a worldview. Some people's worldview is, pardon the term, very, very ignorant. Doesn't mean you're stupid. I'm talking to the camera. Now everybody in here is a genius, I understand. But, but it, it doesn't mean you're stupid. It just means that you're uneducated. And you've chosen not to educate yourself for whatever reason. Everybody has things they're interested in, right? Some people educate themselves in this. And, and you have something called a polymath. A polymath is somebody who is well educated in all kinds of different areas, right? So by the time you get into that young adult life, you're, you're pretty well formed. Your personality was formed 20 years earlier. Uh, you've made up your decision about what the world is, what it's about. Um, you're, you're, you're headed down a path. And when the Lord is ready, he may bring you to the why and the road, right? But you're, you're formed. And so the way you are formed is the way you deal with conundrums. That's correct. Now, if you're raised in that perfect Christian home, and it does, there, there's, there, there out there, Stephanie, you had that pretty much perfect Christian home, didn't you? Yep. Yeah, you're an only child, so you're, you're spoiled and you're a, a brat. Bit. We understand that. <laughs> a little bit. But I guarantee you, I'll bet you, Stephanie, I don't mean to draw you out, but I bet you, you went into your young adult years different than I did. Yeah, I was a hellraiser from every sense of the word. I was. My father um, was an Air Force officer, and my mother was addicted to Valium and alcohol and, 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 and pain pills my whole young adult life, I mean, my childhood, the whole childhood. When I left home, I didn't know nothing. I, I was in four high schools. I was in 10 schools, but four high schools. I didn't learn anything in high school. The only thing I learned in high school was that I could sing. That was it. Yeah. That's kind of when the voice came out. And, and, um, and uh, yeah. So anyway, that was it. I joined the Navy, and off I went. And I just conquered the world any way I could. There was conundrum upon conundrum. I was always coming up to the fork in the road. Weekly, practically, right? But I just kept faking it until I make it. Well, God had a plan for me. People say, well, what do you mean by that? He had a, God has a specific plan for your life. Whether you're in it or not is your choice, not his. God is not going to force you to move to Nome, Alaska. <laughs> and there are people that go to Michigan and set up tanning booths and malls. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. But there are people that do that because God told them to. Right? No, he didn't. God didn't tell you to do that. You see, what, what happens is, is we, we just keep moving forward, particularly those of us who are not grounded and rooted in Christ. And our worldview is, is, is uh, corrupted. Um, we make many, many bad decisions, and it gets us into more conundrums, right? Can you, can you relate a little bit, or you give me a little hallelujah, amen, or something? Amen. Isn't, this, isn't this true? It just depends on how much or how many conundrums we get ourselves into. And you'll find, or I found, as I went into my late 20s and early 30s, that I had the gift of gab, and I was able to be, I, I was a very successful sales representative in the, in the medical uh, device industry. Um, I had no fear. I'd walk right into the operating room like I owned the joint. Um, you know, it's just what I did. But all those years, I was in a conundrum, a bad one, because I didn't know who I was. And so by the time I hit about 30 years old, I completely imploded. And, and if, if you're not, if you're not uh, uh, 
mood altering, spending money, looking at porn, drinking something, taking drugs, if you are on the path I was on, listen to me on the camera, if you were on that path, you're going to implode. It's just a matter of time. You can't do it forever. And God, God calls you. He calls you. And if he needs to take you out to the woodshed, he will. <laughs> That's right. That's how most men come to the Lord. Ladies seem to come to the Lord in a more peaceful way. Uh, because I think y'all maybe are more trusting, perhaps. You you just... You believe uh, in the in the in the in the love of the Lord more than us men do. Us men are stubborn, and stubborn is uh, a, a mild way of explaining my dear old dad, Frank Fry. <laughs> yeah, y'all see him sitting over there, those big blue eyes and that affable personality, and how he's going, oh, okay. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Let me tell you something. <laughs> That man is a is an F-16 gun-shooting uh, firecracker, man. I mean, it's something else. And he's at the end of the road. He is at the end of the road. And I moved here to West Virginia thinking it was kind of a business thing. My brother and I were the... Um, uh, we co-founded a thing called the National Coalition of Healthcare Recruiters, and it got quite large. It was it was successful, but we couldn't work together, and so we split up. He, we were in California, and he wanted to be on the farm, so he moved to West Virginia. And he he researched all the states, and this is the one that he chose. And they have a wonderful place out in the out in the country, and it's called Washington Bottom. I don't even know what that means, the yeah. bottom of George Washington or something. Uh, uh, who knows what that means? And, and, and he's out there, and he's got the land and the barn and the truck and that has a carburetor, and he told me he'll run if there's an EMP that hits and all that routine. I'm like, Jerry, I'm glad you're having a great time. I, I thought that's why I came here. Um, uh, I was at a crossroads. In my life, at about age fifty-five, my goodness, and it was it was time to do something new. So I just jumped, and it was a big jump too. I'm here to tell you, I did a quadruple gainer off the short board. <laughs> <laughs> and when I got here, I I had just never seen a culture like this ever. This culture in West Virginia, good, bad, or indifferent, it's, it's a different country yep. than Orange County, California. <laughs> it just is. This is where real people live. Yeah. Amen. It is. It's where real people live. Yeah. And I, I decided after a month that I was going to stay. I almost went back. The reason I almost went back wasn't because of my brother or because you don't have good restaurants here. <laughs> if I have to see Applebee's one more time, <laughs> I'm jumping for joy that there's a new restaurant up the street. I think I'll come there for one. Um, We're not open for <laughs> I stayed because I hated my dad. <laughs> yeah. I loved my mom. My mom was, I'm, I'm just like my mom. I'm, I'm, I was, um, I could sing and dance and, and, you know, and all that routine. My mom was a kind of a uh, singer, dancer kind of thing. She, you know, but my dad, I hadn't been around him at all in those 30 years. Uh, we visited maybe two or three times. And every time I would fly to them. My father has never met his grandchildren. Hmm. No. Extreme loner. Narcissist. Yeah. And don't worry, he'll never see this video. You know. That's what it's what most fighter pilots are. I I hate to I hate to besmirch you find men that fly the F-35, but it's true. Um, and back in the day, 
you want to talk about gunslingers, wild. I mean, these guys were unbelievable. And the reason they were is because they didn't know when the wing was going to come off the airplane. The F-100 was the first fighter that was introduced to Vietnam. It had a problem. The wing fell off. <laughs> that's a problem. <laughs> yeah, that's a problem. <laughs> so I hated him. I called my brother up and I told him, I said, I'm, I'm leaving. I, I can't do this. I, I don't want to know this person. I really didn't know him at all. It was always, yes, sir. You know, there was no, no. I don't recall my father or my mother calling me and saying, hi, how are you, ever, when I left home. Not once. And their attitude was this, look, you're the kid, I'm the parent. If you want to chit-chat, you dial the phone. If you want to visit, you get on the airplane. When I was a child, my, my father told us that we were all visitors in the home. That it was not our home. And at age 18, there's the door. University, United States Marine Corps, Navy, Air Force, whatever. But there's the door. Yeah. You say, Bill, you're being awful hard on your father. I want y'all to understand the depth of this conundrum. Because everyone in this room has probably had something similar to this with a friend or a family member, I would imagine. Maybe not this bad, but friends, it was bad. I stayed. A month later, he had a big heart attack. And for the first time ever, the first time ever, Ronnie, can I have a water? I saw, I saw Frank Fry on his back. It was stunning to be um, incapacitated. It was stunning. So I stayed. I stayed, and I met Michelle, thank God, <laughs> and got married. But in the last several years, thank you, in the last several years, um, Michelle and I did everything for my mom and dad. We cleaned their house once a week, food, everything. And the old man really wasn't that incapacitated, but you know, we kind of just did what he said to do, always have. And mom died. And it was a relief for me that she was, in my opinion, she was free. Yeah. Because the older my father got, the really the meaner he got. You know, you would you would be shocked at what this man will say to you. What he said to the nurses in the hospital, it's, it's shocking. You know, no filter. Just I'm the general, you're the peon. Get me the whatever, paint. The last couple of years, I've been taking care of my dad, and I've been enjoying it. But it's been painful. <laughs> it's a conundrum. Because, and I'll tell you exactly what the conundrum is in just a second. I want to, and I need to have that relationship. Beloved, we are born with the need, the <laughs> desire. It's, it's, it's in our soul that we would connect with mom and dad. It, it cannot be taken away. You can push it back all you want, but it will never go away. Yeah. It is an innate uh, existential part of who you are. And despite the, 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 the way he, he acts and treats people and so forth and so on, and, and, and you know, me in particular, because I'm the only one that would go over there and help, you know. And I'm not going to tell you the 
type of stuff I had to do, but it was pretty gnarly. And as that time frame went on, though, people would say to me, particularly my brother John, who he, he will have nothing to do with it. My sisters haven't seen him in 40 years. I, right? um, I was enjoying it, personally. To me, it was uh, a pleasure to, to somehow get to know Frank Fry. And there was a gratitude that began to express itself. Um, we would go to the bookstores, and I, I bought him a Bible, and he would come to church, and I thought, this is amazing. God is working on the gunslinger. And a disruption occurred a few months ago. A very difficult situation occurred. And I had to withdraw completely from his life. <coughs> and it was a choice that I had to make. The conundrum. How do you how do you spend your whole adult life not getting to know mom or dad, grandma, grandpa, cousin, niece, nephew, child? How do you do that? And then re-enter and things are going okay, but then a, 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 a wrench gets thrown into the engine and, you, and you, you've got to pull back. And that's what I did. I, I made an abrupt stop. I hit the brakes. And all the voicemails from him are still on my phone. Um, you wouldn't believe the things that my dad said to me uh, and accused my brother and I of. Um, it was really bad. And you know, the first week it was difficult. I, I, I really wanted to uh, see the old man uh, and help him. Remember my Christmas sermon where I asked you if you've ever cut your dad's toenails before? That was the that was my lead statement at Christmas. Have you ever cut your dad's toenails? Yeah. Listen, folks, old people gotta get their toenails cut. Somebody's gotta do it. That's another sermon for next week. <laughs> A week went by, two weeks went by, three weeks, and I, I really labored over this. And, I, and I'm going to tell you why I labored over it. Because all the thoughts and feelings, the Christian stuff, came into play. Yeah. Yeah. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Wow. Hmm. If anyone were to sue you or take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. Yeah. It took me about a month to break away um, emotionally. But I had made up my mind that a line had been crossed that was not resolvable. And you know, in the military, they call it the red line. Yeah. Iran right now, there's a red line. If Iran puts a nuclear weapon on top of a ballistic missile, they are going to be nuked by Israel. Mark my words. And they will do it. It's a red line. The red line had been drawn. Another couple of weeks went by, and I had completely forgotten the uh, frustration. And it was almost daily. Ask Rusty. I tell Rusty almost everything that I, I go through. And Rusty and I are Siamese twins. <laughs> He ate more than I did when he was a child. <laughs> <laughs> the truth is, he'd 
knock me out and push me away from the table. <laughs> <laughs> After about six weeks, I, it was, I was fine. No more frustration. No more feelings of guilt. You know, where well, the Bible can guilt you, can it? Sure enough, can. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Haha, -ha, Jesus, of course. <laughs> Jesus says, I do not say to you seven times, but 70 times. In other words, don't stop forgiving. Seven times 70, that's 490 punches in the nose. Yeah. You know, that's pretty difficult. Yeah. Huh? Can you guys identify? Anybody in the room identifying right now? Yes. Everybody, you got that Uncle Harry in your life. I know you do. We all do. <laughs> Brother, sister. You know, and some of you watching my camera, maybe a couple of you in here, are actually the perpetrator. I hope not, but it's possible. Um, the reason that I I feel like I understand things better than most is because I'm very well read, and I've done almost everything wrong you can possibly imagine. <laughs> or I've seen it done wrong. And I've seen when the pastor handled it properly or not. That's how we learn, isn't it? And so you look at this and you go, seven times 70? You mean I got to keep going back? I mean, how many times am I going to go back and be called a... <laughs> so by the time Michelle and I got down to Florida, um, I was completely at peace with the whole thing. I thought. So we come home and I get a call from Marietta Memorial Hospital saying your dad's here. I'm like, what's he doing there? He's not well. He's very, very sick. Um, kidney failure, advanced UTI, when a, when a senior citizen has a UTI, it almost always leads to a total disorientation. Literally, you can almost kind of go crazy. He was completely shut down. And the first day I heard about it, I didn't go. I'm done. I've had enough. Oh, the conundrum got bigger. Yeah. I'm just, I'm not going to do this. It's behind me. If he dies, cremate him. I'll drive him down to Pensacola and stick him in the box at, at the Navy base. And we're done with it. My brothers and sisters won't come. You won't even call. As in telephone? Nothing. You ever go into a hospital, somebody's sick, there's no flowers in the room? The second day I am fighting with myself. <laughs> seven times seventy. Lord, I don't like that scripture. I'm gonna ignore it. <laughs> Bill, you he 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 took your coat that you gotta give him, your tunic. What are you going to turn the other cheek, Mr. Pastor Man? <laughs> Mr. Christian? <laughs> Thought you were a Christian. I was manic. And uh, I was, Michelle was able to speak to me and, and help me land. Likelihood of y'all ever seeing me manic is almost zero. Um, you'll see me kind of up and down, but you're, you'll never see me manic. Did I don't tell you I'm bipolar? Did you know that? Yeah. I'm a 
was diagnosed when I was in the hospital in 1990. One day I wanted to jump off the bridge and the next day I'm at Nordstrom's charging $10,000 on a credit card. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's called being bipolar. Yeah. Oh! So, there's drugs for that, and they work. By the way. <laughs> Counseling drugs. I called up Michelle and said, honey, I don't know what to do. She said, she said, you don't have to go to the hospital, William. Trust me. <laughs> William, you don't have to go to the hospital. You've done all you can do. There's no reason to rip open the scab. Now, if he wakes up, because he was out, eyes closed, gurgling breath, the whole, man, it was scary. The doctor, um, well, wait, I'm ahead of myself. She said, if, if he wakes up, then you should go. But there is no reason to go there and, and just get demolished. Because my dad still has never looked me in the eyes and said, I love you. Give me a hug. Never. My mom did all the time. She, she made up for it. My mommy loved me. I was the baby. The second day, about two in the afternoon, I'm like, dang it. I hate this. I have to be a Christian. <laughs> I drove to the hospital. I called myself, go to the hospital. She said, okay. She said, I'll, I'll be praying for you. I thought he was dying. They pretty much told me he was dying. So I'm crying all the way to the hospital. I'm going through all the emotions, all the memories. You know, I'm I, oh god, I could spend a no, I won't do that. <laughs> I manned up though, I got to the hospital. Chug it up, Bill. <laughs> Hi! Carry on. In the elevator I went, up down the hallway, I get to the nurse's station. Hi, my name's Bill Fry. Hi there, your dad's around in the room, blah, blah, blah. I go down there, he's, he's completely out. Moaning and groaning and moving his arms around. And he was gurgling in his, his chest. I thought, okay, this guy's dying. The doctor came in. The doctor said to me, do you have a DNR on him? Are you the POA? And I'm like, yeah, I'm power of attorney. I, he says he doesn't, he's not a do not resuscitate. He should be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the doctor told me that. I said, then make him one. And they did. They put the red tag on his arm. The doctor said to me, Mr. Fry, I, I don't expect your father to come out of this. You need to know that. So prepare yourself. So what did I do? I sat there and held his hand. I don't remember my dad one time taking my hand when I was a child. Not one time. Maybe he did. I don't remember. So I went home. Now the conundrum is really getting bad. And please know that I forgave my dad a long time ago for being a lousy dad. He was horrible. Gave a long time ago. That was way past. And I was enjoying the relationship. We actually would have fun sometimes. You, a man that flies an F 4 Phantom at 1,600 miles an hour and you're going through the mall on a scooter? <laughs> I've really wrestled with God. I really wrestled with God on this. I said, oh, what in the world? What does this mean, seven times 70? Well, the Bible says seven times 70. How many is that? Until, hold on, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you something important right here. I'm gonna give you a principle that you may have never thought of before. I had a unique thought. I, I've been having these lately. It's kind of scaring me. <laughs> Thank you. 
If there's nothing to forgive someone for, do you need to forgive them? Come on, people. If there's nothing to forgive someone for, do you need to forgive them? No. What's there to forgive them for? Do you really have to get punched in the face 490 times before you figure it out? No. No. Principle to take home with you today, and you on the camera, listen closely, write it down. When you get to about 50, stop! Don't let somebody abuse you. That's not what Jesus meant. But if you're not going to remove yourself from this life after it is very obvious that the situation is not going to change, it is untenable, and you are going to be in misery and in guilt the rest of your life because you the Bible says to forgive forever? No. That's not what Jesus meant. How do I know that? I just feel it in my heart. And I never thought this before. It came to me after the second visit to my dad. He's laying there and I'm thinking, this is cool. He can never hurt me again. He's going to die. Just walk away. Put it down. When you get to about 25 or 30 or 50 or 60 times, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to have these evil thoughts about you. Stop! Get it out of your life. Don't let someone cause you to feel guilt and shame and have to keep going back and saying to the Lord I'm sorry. I mean what's there to forgive for? Right? And then it got more rich because then he woke up. <laughs> eyes popped open, those big blue eyes. I have my mom's eyes. My mom told me one time, she said, Billy, you have the kindest eyes. <laughs> yeah. I miss my mom. She was so sweet. She never could get away from me. So Frank wakes up. Frank! <laughs> Frank wakes up. I'm like, crap. No. <laughs> the situation had changed though, because the 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 situation had changed. And now it was just me and him again. And I knew exactly what was going to happen. And so I re-engaged. And he was really, uh, he's been pretty sweet. But he's very sick. They took him to the rehab center up here at Encompass. He was there. Oh, <laughs> the sweetness disappeared. <laughs> he would call me, get me out of here! <laughs> I don't know why people think that they can curse at a, at a nurse. You know what, though? When I was a young man, I did it. Right? 
Dad, I'm putting you into the assisted living center. No, you're not! Dad, you can't walk. You've got a Foley catheter. Your legs are this big. They are, they are weeping water. Your kidneys are failing. Your heart's not doing well. Dad, come on, please. Please. No! I refuse! <laughs> All right, Dad. Two nights ago, we go home. I get him in his big chair. I hired a company to come in, a caregiver to come in for two hours in the morning and two in the afternoon. I said, Dad, don't get out of the chair. He, that's all he does anyway, sit in the chair. Friday night, we do a CR. That's why I, I rushed out of here at 8.30 to put him in the bed. You ever put your dad in bed? <laughs> you will. If your dad's alive and you're having a relationship with him and that he lives near you, you're going to put your dad in bed. There's, it's, it's, it's surreal. But it, now he's being really nice and he's, you know, and I, so I, okay, dad, now listen to me. Don't. Get up. You don't get up anyway. You have a Foley catheter. Just please just lay there and sleep. Ambulance, 3 a.m. Mm -hmm. Yep. He gets up, falls down. Mm -hmm. They put him in bed. 4 a.m. Ambulance, again. Mm -hmm. We have the service. You hit the button and it, and it calls you. And yep. I told the third time, the third call came in at 5 and I said, he's fine. Don't worry about it. Oh, well. Yeah. <laughs> Just let him lay on the floor. I called up Wendy. I didn't get a chance. It's like, William Joseph Fry, <laughs> you little turd. <laughs> <laughs> Will, Pastor Bill. As Michelle says, well, I'm an idiot. Pastor Bill. <laughs> I called up Wendy and I said, would you go over there and see what's going on, please? I, you know, on the floor. They took him into the main house. He was he was completely done. He's there now in the main facility, just as quiet as a as a mouse. <laughs> so what do I do here? What do I do? What would you do? What would Jesus do? <laughs> Let me share another principle with you. Principle number one, stop the trauma, even if it's your dad. Because every time something happens and you feel guilty, you're going to feel like you have to go apologize. God, I'm so sorry. You know how many people spend all the time, I'm so sorry, God, please don't kill me. Stop what God wants. He wants us to be filled with joy. He wants us to be happy. But you've got to get out of the mud. Mm -hmm. Right? Amen. James Dobson said, if you take a white glove and stick it in the mud, the mud is not going to get glovey. <laughs> Think about that. Principle number two. Jesus didn't say how many tunics you have to give away. He didn't say how many times to let the person slap you on the other cheek. Mm -hmm. He just said, turn the other cheek. He didn't say how many, though. One, two, three, maybe four times. That's enough. That's enough. Jesus doesn't want us getting beat up and treated like dogs. And, you know, you say to me, Pastor Bill, you, are you saying your dad treated you like a dog when he was angry. He did. Yes, he did. He most certainly did. My wife doesn't want to, and Michelle loves everything. <laughs> Everybody. Jesus isn't counting how many times you turn your cheek. Once is enough. Give him your tunic and walk away. 
Don't keep going back. Handing out more tunics and turning more sheets. You can stop. It's okay. It's okay. What did Jesus say about this? In the remaining few minutes that we have, let me read to you what Jesus said. And while I'm opening up this scripture, I want to remind you of something um, that I failed to remind you or say at the very beginning. And that is that the Bible is full of conundrums. <laughs> it is. Not, not um, contradiction, but it's full of conundrums. What saved always saved? Elect, free will, pre-trip, mid-trip, post-trip rapture, <laughs> pre-millennial, mid-millennial, post-millennial, all-millennial. It's filled with conundrums, and you'll never resolve them. So as you look at the Bible and something, a verse jumps out at you and you say, that's what I'm going to do. If it's not crystal clear, get some counsel. Talk to somebody you know that's been reading the Bible for 30 years and say, what does this mean? And they'll explain it to you. You know how many people go around in life guilty because they think they haven't asked forgiveness from everything and everybody, and it, it just, you know, you just wear yourself out. Once is enough. I'm sorry. And remember, there's no but on the end of sorry. <laughs> it's just, I'm sorry. Yeah. Don't tell them what they did. Don't, no, it's just, hey, listen. I was rude to you, and I'm sorry. Very recently, I I was quite rude to a guy at the uh, car dealership. I lost I lost my temper. But no, I went in there after an hour went by. I walked up to the guy and I said, "Bring the manager out." The manager came out and he stood right there and I said, "I'm sorry. I was rude." I'm sorry. Would you like to punch me in the face? He said, no. <laughs> Look, that's it. That's it. But don't go back to the vomit. Amen? Jesus says here, as you enter into a house, greet it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. In other words, get out. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave the house or the town. Move on. Now, beloved, don't misunderstand me here. Do everything you can to create peace. The Bible says to love your neighbor. You want to create peace. But there comes a time when you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. Somebody had the, <laughs> I don't know what it was, to say to me several months ago, do you pray for him? <laughs> Rusty, shoot me, man. Be paid for him. Oh. Yeah? Do principle number two. After you've given them your shirt and your cloak, walk away. It's not resolved, Pastor Joe. Then resolve it. Write him a letter. And don't write a mean letter. <laughs> Dear so and so, and I've written many letters to my father. Dear so and so, I want you to know that you hurt my feelings. Here's how you hurt my feelings, and I want you to know that I understand. And I was upset, and because I was upset, I want to tell you I'm sorry. If 
I hurt your feelings in any way. Love builds. And move on. Amen? Mm -hmm. Amen. The conundrum can be resolved, and it can be resolved with the Word of God. But make sure you understand the Word of God so you don't gouge your eye out. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> All right? Mm -hmm. If your eye causes you to sin, get out of your eye. Who has a question or a comment? Not a long testimony, but a question or a comment. Yes, ma'am. Um, actually, I was just thinking of that specific verse that um, gouge your eye out and cast it away or um, cut off your arm and cast mm -hmm. it away. Um, I think maybe that's a metaphor for what you were talking about. Walk away from the situation. Because in another place, it says we're all part of the same body. <laughs> True. Yeah. Don't get out your <laughs> Specifically, that verse is saying, men, if you have trouble with the lust of the eye, Jesus is saying, don't do that. He uses what's called hyperbole, mm -hmm. an extreme example. You just gouge your eye out. Don't gouge your eye out. Yes, ma'am. Thanks, ma'am. Please. 